The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, An Introduction, by Michel Foucault. Part 2. The Repressive Hypothesis. 1. The Incitement to Discourse. The 17th century, then, was the beginning of an age of repression emblematic of what we call the bourgeois societies, an age which perhaps we still have not completely left behind. Calling sex by its name thereafter became more difficult and more costly, as if in order to gain mastery over it in reality, it had first been necessary to subjugate it at the level of language, control its free circulation in speech, expunge it from the things that were said, and extinguish the words that rendered it too visibly present. And even these prohibitions, it seems, were afraid to name it. Without even having to pronounce the word, modern prudishness was able to ensure that one did not speak of sex merely through the interplay of prohibitions that referred back to one another, instances of muteness which, by dint of saying nothing, imposed silence, censorship. Yet when one looks back over these last three centuries with their continual transformations, things appear in a very different light. Around and apropos of sex, one sees a veritable discursive explosion. We must be clear on this point, however. It is quite possible that there was an expurgation, and a very rigorous one, of the authorized vocabulary. It may indeed be true that a whole rhetoric of illusion and metaphor was codified. Without question, new rules of propriety screened out some words. There was a policing of statements, a control over enunciations as well where and when it was not possible to talk about such things became much more strictly defined, in which circumstances, among which speakers, and within which social relationships. Areas were thus established, if not of utter silence, at least of tact and discretion, between parents and children, for instance, or teachers and pupils, or masters and domestic servants. This almost certainly constituted a whole restrictive economy, one that was incorporated into that politics of language and speech, spontaneous on the one hand, concerted on the other, which accompanied the social redistributions of the classical period. At the level of discourses and their domains, however, practically the opposite phenomenon occurred. There was a steady proliferation of discourses concerned with sex, specific discourses different from one another both by their form and by their object, a discursive ferment that gathered momentum from the 18th century onward. Here I am thinking not so much of the probable increase in illicit discourses, that is, discourses of infraction that crudely named sex by way of insult or mockery of the new code of decency. The tightening up of the rules of decorum likely did produce, as a counter-effect, a valorization and intensification of indecent speech, but more important was the multiplication of discourses concerning sex in the field of exercise of power itself, an institutional incitement to speak about it, and to do so more and more, a determination on the part of the agencies of power to hear it spoken about, and to cause it to speak through explicit articulation and endlessly accumulated detail. Consider the evolution of the Catholic pastoral and the sacrament of penance after the Council of Trent. Little by little, the nakedness of the questions formulated by the confession manuals of the Middle Ages, and a good number of those still in use in the 17th century, was veiled. One avoided entering into that degree of detail which some authors, such as Sanchez or Tamburini, had for a long time believed indispensable for the confession to be complete description of the respective positions of the partners, the postures assumed, gestures, places touched, caresses, the precise moment of pleasure, an entire painstaking review of the sexual act in its very unfolding. Discretion was advised with increasing emphasis. The greatest reserve was counselled when dealing with sins against purity. This matter is similar to pitch, for, however one might handle it, even to cast it far from oneself, it sticks nonetheless, and always soils. And later, Alfonso de Liguori prescribed starting, and possibly going no further, especially when dealing with children, with questions that were roundabout and vague. But while the language may have been refined, the scope of the confession, the confession of the flesh, continually increased. 
This was partly because the Counter-Reformation busied itself with stepping up the rhythm of the yearly confession in the Catholic countries, and because it tried to impose meticulous rules of self-examination. But above all, because it attributed more and more importance in penance, and perhaps at the expense of some other sins, to all the insinuations of the flesh. Thoughts, desires, voluptuous imaginings, delectations, combined movements of the body and the soul, Henceforth all this had to enter in detail into the process of confession and guidance. According to the new pastoral, sex must not be named imprudently, but its aspects, its correlations and its effects must be pursued down to their slenderest ramifications. A shadow in a daydream, an image too slowly dispelled, a badly exorcised complicity between the body's mechanics and the mind's complacency. Everything had to be told. A twofold evolution tended to make the flesh into the root of all evil, shifting the most important moment of transgression from the act itself to the stirrings, so difficult to perceive and formulate, of desire. For this was an evil that afflicted the whole man, and in the most secret of forms. Examine diligently, therefore, all the faculties of your soul, memory, understanding, and will. Examine with precision all your senses as well. Examine, moreover, all your thoughts, every word you speak, and all your actions. Examine even unto your dreams to know if, once awakened, you did not give them your consent. And finally, do not think that in so sensitive and perilous a matter as this there is anything trivial or insignificant. Discourse, therefore, had to trace the meeting line of the body and the soul, following all its meanderings. Beneath the surface of the sins, it would lay bare the unbroken nervure of the flesh. Under the authority of a language that had been carefully expurgated, so that it was no longer directly named, sex was taken charge of, tracked down, as it were, by a discourse that aimed to allow it no obscurity, no respite. It was here, perhaps, that the injunction, so peculiar to the West, was laid down for the first time, in the form of a general constraint. I am not talking about the obligation to admit to violations of the laws of sex, as required by traditional penance, but of the nearly infinite task of telling, telling oneself and another, as often as possible, everything that might concern the interplay of innumerable pleasures, sensations, and thoughts, which through the body and the soul, had some affinity with sex. This scheme for transforming sex into discourse had been devised long before in an ascetic and monastic setting. The seventeenth century made it into a rule for everyone. It would seem, in actual fact, that it could scarcely have applied to any but a tiny elite. The great majority of the faithful, who only went to confession on rare occasions in the course of the year, escaped such complex prescriptions. But the important point, no doubt, is that this obligation was decreed, as an ideal at least, for every good Christian. An imperative was established. Not only will you confess to acts contravening the law, but you will seek to transform your desire, your every desire, into discourse. In so far as possible, nothing was meant to elude this dictum, even if the words it employed had to be carefully neutralized. The Christian pastoral prescribed as a fundamental duty the task of passing everything having to do with sex through the endless mill of speech. The forbidding of certain words, the decency of expressions, all the censorings of vocabulary might well have been only secondary devices compared to that great subjugation, ways of rendering it morally acceptable and technically useful. One could plot a line going straight from the 17th century pastoral to what became its projection in literature, scandalous literature at that. Tell everything, the directors would say time and again, not only consummated acts but sensual touchings, all impure gazes, all obscene remarks, all consenting thoughts. Saad takes up the injunction in words that seem to have been retranscribed from the treatises of spiritual direction. Your narrations must be decorated with the most numerous and searching details, the precise way and extent to which we may judge how the passion you describe relates to human manners, and man's character is determined by your willingness to disguise no circumstance.' 
and what is more, the least circumstance is apt to have an immense influence upon the procuring of that kind of sensory irritation we expect from your stories. And again, at the end of the nineteenth century, the anonymous author of My Secret Life submitted to the same prescription. Outwardly, at least, this man was doubtless a kind of traditional libertine, but he conceived the idea of complementing his life, which he had almost totally dedicated to sexual activity, with a scrupulous account of every one of its episodes. He sometimes excuses himself by stressing his concern to educate young people. This man, who had eleven volumes published, in a printing of only a few copies, which were devoted to the least adventures, pleasures, and sensations of his sex. It is best to take him at his word when he lets into his text the voice of a pure imperative. I recount the facts, just as they happened, in so far as I am able to recollect them. This is all that I can do. A secret life must not leave out anything. There is nothing to be ashamed of. One can never know too much concerning human nature. The solitary author of My Secret Life often says, in order to justify his describing them, that his strangest practices undoubtedly were shared by thousands of men on the surface of the earth. But the guiding principle for the strangest of these practices, which was the fact of recounting them all, and in detail from day to day, had been lodged in the heart of modern man for over two centuries. Rather than seeing in this singular man a courageous fugitive from a Victorianism that would have compelled him to silence, I am inclined to think that, in an epoch dominated by highly prolix directives enjoining discretion and modesty, he was the most direct and, in a way, the most naive representative of a plurisecular injunction to talk about sex. The historical accident would consist rather of the reticences of Victorian Puritanism. At any rate, they were a digression, a refinement, a tactical diversion in the great process of transforming sex into discourse. This nameless Englishman will serve better than his queen as the central figure for a sexuality whose main features were already taking shape with the Christian pastoral. Doubtless, in contrast to the latter, for him it was a matter of augmenting the sensations he experienced with the details of what he said about them. Like Saad, he wrote for his pleasure alone, in the strongest sense of the expression. He carefully mixed the editing and re-reading of his text with erotic scenes which those writers' activities repeated, prolonged, and stimulated. But after all, the Christian pastoral also sought to produce specific effects on desire by the mere fact of transforming it, fully and deliberately, into discourse— effects of mastery and detachment, to be sure, but also an effect of spiritual reconversion, of turning back to God, a physical effect of blissful suffering from feeling in one's body the pangs of temptation and the love that resists it. This is the essential thing, that Western man has been drawn for three centuries to the task of telling everything concerning his sex, that since the classical age there has been a constant optimization and an increasing valorization of the discourse on sex, and that this carefully analytical discourse was meant to yield multiple effects of displacement, intensification, reorientation, and modification of desire itself. Not only were the boundaries of what one could say about sex enlarged, and men compelled to hear it said, but more important, discourse was connected to sex by a complex organization with varying effects, by a deployment that cannot be adequately explained merely by referring it to a law of prohibition. A censorship of sex? There was installed rather an apparatus for producing an ever greater quantity of discourse about sex, capable of functioning and taking effect in its very economy. This technique might have remained tied to the destiny of Christian spirituality if it had not been supported and relayed by other mechanisms. In the first place, by a public interest. Not a collective curiosity or sensibility, not a new mentality, but power mechanisms that functioned in such a way that discourse on sex, for reasons that will have to be examined, became essential. Toward the beginning of the 18th century, there emerged a political, economic, and technical incitement to talk about sex, and not so much in the form of a general theory of sexuality, 
as in the form of analysis, stock-taking, classification and specification of quantitative or causal studies. This need to take sex into account, to pronounce a discourse on sex that would not derive from morality alone but from rationality as well, was sufficiently new that at first it wondered at itself and sought apologies for its own existence. How could a discourse based on reason speak of that? Rarely have philosophers directed a steady gaze to these objects situated between disgust and ridicule, where one must avoid both hypocrisy and scandal. And nearly a century later, the medical establishment, which one might have expected to be less surprised by what it was about to formulate, still stumbled at the moment of speaking. The darkness that envelops these facts, the shame and disgust they inspire, have always repelled the observer's gaze. For a long time I hesitated to introduce the loathsome picture into this study. What is essential is not in all these scruples, in the moralism they betray, or in the hypocrisy one can suspect them of, but in the recognized necessity of overcoming this hesitation. One had to speak of sex. One had to speak publicly and in a manner that was not determined by the division between licit and illicit, even if the speaker maintained the distinction for himself, which is what these solemn and preliminary declarations were intended to show. One had to speak of it as of a thing to be not simply condemned or tolerated, but managed, inserted into systems of utility, regulated for the greater good of all, made to function according to an optimum. Sex was not something one simply judged. It was a thing one administered. It was in the nature of a public potential. It called for management procedures. It had to be taken charge of by analytical discourses. In the 18th century, sex became a police matter, in the full and strict sense given the term at the time, not the repression of disorder, but an ordered maximization of collective and individual forces. We must consolidate and augment, through the wisdom of its regulations, the internal power of the state, and since this power consists not only in the republic in general, and in each of the members who constitute it, but also in the faculties and talents of those belonging to it, it follows that the police must concern themselves with these means and make them serve the public welfare, and they can only obtain this result through the knowledge they have of those different assets. A policing of sex, that is, not the rigour of a taboo, but the necessity of regulating sex through useful and public discourses. A few examples will suffice. One of the great innovations in the techniques of power in the 18th century was the emergence of population as an economic and political problem. Population as wealth, population as manpower or labour capacity, population balanced between its own growth and the resources it commanded. Governments perceived that they were not dealing simply with subjects or even with a people, but with a population, with its specific phenomena and its peculiar variables, birth and death rates, life expectancy, fertility, state of health, frequency of illnesses, patterns of diet and habitation. All these variables were situated at the point where the characteristic movements of life and the specific effects of institutions intersected. States are not populated in accordance with the natural progression of propagation, but by virtue of their industry, their products, and their different institutions. Men multiply like the yields from the ground, and in proportion to the advantages and resources they find in their labors. At the heart of this economic and political problem of population was sex. It was necessary to analyze the birth rate, the age of marriage, the legitimate and illegitimate births, the precocity and frequency of sexual relations, the ways of making them fertile or sterile, the effects of unmarried life or of the prohibitions, the impact of contraceptive practices, of those notorious deadly secrets which demographers on the eve of the revolution knew were already familiar to the inhabitants of the countryside. Of course, it had long been asserted that a country had to be populated if it hoped to be rich and powerful. But this was the first time that a society had affirmed, in a constant way, that its future and its fortune were tied not only to the number and the uprightness of its citizens, to their marriage rules and family organization, but to the manner in which each individual made use of his sex. Things went from ritual lamenting over the unfruitful debauchery of the rich 
bachelors and libertines, to a discourse in which the sexual conduct of the population was taken both as an object of analysis and as a target of intervention. There was a progression from the crudely populationist arguments of the mercantilist epoch to the much more subtle and calculated attempts at regulation that tended to favour or discourage, according to the objectives and exigencies of the moment, an increasing birth rate. Through the political economy of population there was formed a whole grid of observations regarding sex. There emerged the analysis of the modes of sexual conduct, their determinations and their effects, at the boundary line of the biological and the economic domains. There also appeared those systematic campaigns which, going beyond the traditional means, moral and religious exhortations, fiscal measures, tried to transform the sexual conduct of couples into a concerted economic and political behaviour. In time, these new measures would become anchorage points for the different varieties of racism of the 19th and 20th centuries. It was essential that the state know what was happening with its citizens' sex and the use they made of it, but also that each individual be capable of controlling the use he made of it. Between the state and the individual, sex became an issue, and a public issue no less. A whole web of discourses, special knowledges, analyses, and injunctions settled upon it. The situation was similar in the case of children's sex. It is often said that the classical period consigned it to an obscurity from which it scarcely emerged before the three essays, or the beneficent anxieties of little Hans. It is true that a long-standing freedom of language between children and adults or pupils and teachers may have disappeared. No 17th-century pedagogue would have publicly advised his disciple, as did Erasmus in his dialogues, on the choice of a good prostitute. And the boisterous laughter that had accompanied the precocious sexuality of children for so long, and in all social classes, it seems, was gradually stifled. But this was not a plain and simple imposition of silence. Rather, it was a new regime of discourses. Not any less was said about it, on the contrary. But things were said in a different way. It was different people who said them from different points of view, and in order to obtain different results. Silence itself, the things one declines to say or is forbidden to name, the discretion that is required between different speakers, is less the absolute limit of discourse, the other side from which it is separated by a strict boundary, than an element that functions alongside the things said, with them and in relation to them within overall strategies. There is no binary division to be made between what one says and what one does not say. We must try to determine the different ways of not saying such things, how those who can and those who cannot speak of them are distributed, which type of discourse is authorised, or which form of discretion is required in either case. There is not one, but many silences, and they are an integral part of the strategies that underlie and permeate discourses. Take the secondary schools of the 18th century, for example. On the whole, one can have the impression that sex was hardly spoken of at all in these institutions. But one only has to glance over the architectural layout, the rules of discipline, and their whole internal organization. The question of sex was a constant preoccupation. The builders considered it explicitly. The organizers took it permanently into account. All who held a measure of authority were placed in a state of perpetual alert, which the fixtures, the precautions taken, the interplay of punishments and responsibilities never ceased to reiterate. The space for classes, the shape of the tables, the planning of the recreation lessons, the distribution of the dormitories, with or without partitions, with or without curtains, the rules of monitoring bedtime and sleep periods, all this referred in the most prolix manner to the sexuality of children. What one might call the internal discourse of the institution, the one it employed to address itself and which circulated among those who made it function, was largely based on the assumption that this sexuality existed, that it was precocious, active, and ever-present. But this was not all. The sex of the schoolboy became, in the course of the 18th century, and quite apart from that of adolescence in general, a public problem. Doctors counseled the directors and professors of educational establishments, but they also gave their opinions to families. Educators designed projects which they submitted to the authorities.
schoolmasters turned to students, made recommendations to them, and drafted for their benefit books of exhortation, full of moral and medical examples. Around the schoolboy and his sex there proliferated a whole literature of precepts, opinions, observations, medical advice, clinical cases, outlines for reform, and plans for ideal institutions. With Basadov and the German philanthropic movement, this transformation of adolescent sex into discourse grew to considerable dimensions. Zaltzmann even organized an experimental school which owed its exceptional character to a supervision and education of sex so well thought out that youth's universal sin would never need to be practiced there. And with all these measures taken, the child was not to be simply the mute and unconscious object of attentions prearranged between adults only. A certain reasonable, limited, canonical, and truthful discourse on sex was prescribed for him, a kind of discursive orthopedics. The great festival organized at the Philanthropinum in May of 1776 can serve as a vignette in this regard. Taking the form of an examination, mixed with floral games, the awarding of prizes, and a board of review, this was the first solemn communion of adolescent sex and reasonable discourse. In order to show the success of the sex education given the students, Basadov had invited all the dignitaries that Germany could muster. Goethe was one of the few to decline the invitation. Before the assembled public, one of the professors, a certain Volker, asked the students selected questions concerning the mysteries of sex, birth, and procreation. He had them comment on engravings that depicted a pregnant woman, a couple, and a cradle. The replies were enlightened, offered without shame or embarrassment. No unseemly laughter intervened to disturb them, except from the very ranks of an adult audience more childish than the children themselves, and whom Volker severely reprimanded. At the end, they all applauded these cherub-faced boys, who, in front of adults, had skilfully woven the garlands of discourse and sex. It would be less than exact to say that the pedagogical institution has imposed a ponderous silence on the sex of children and adolescents. On the contrary, since the 18th century it has multiplied the forms of discourse on the subject. It has established various points of implantation for sex. It has coded contents and qualified speakers. Speaking about children's sex, inducing educators, physicians, administrators, and parents to speak of it, or speaking to them about it, causing children themselves to talk about it, and enclosing them in a web of discourses which sometimes address them, sometimes speak about them, or impose canonical bits of knowledge on them, or use them as a basis for constructing a science that is beyond their grasp, all this together enables us to link an intensification of the interventions of power to a multiplication of discourse. The sex of children and adolescents has become, since the 18th century, an important area of contention around which innumerable institutional devices and discursive strategies have been deployed. It may well be true that adults and children themselves were deprived of a certain way of speaking about sex, a mode that was disallowed as being too direct, crude, or coarse. But this was only the counterpart of other discourses, and perhaps the condition necessary in order for them to function, discourses that were interlocking, hierarchized, and all highly articulated around a cluster of power relations. One could mention many other centers which in the 18th or 19th century began to produce discourses on sex. First there was medicine, via the nervous disorders. Next, psychiatry, when it set out to discover the etiology of mental illnesses, focusing its gaze first on excess, then onanism, then frustration, then frauds against procreation, but especially when it annexed the whole of the sexual perversions as its own province. Criminal justice, too, which had long been concerned with sexuality, particularly in the form of heinous crimes and crimes against nature, but which, toward the middle of the 19th century, broadened its jurisdiction to include petty offences, minor indecencies, insignificant perversions, and lastly, all those social controls, cropping up at the end of the last century, which screened the sexuality of couples, parents and children, dangerous and endangered adolescents, undertaking to protect, separate and forewarn, signalling perils everywhere, awaking people's attention, calling for diagnoses, piling up reports, organizing therapies. 
These sites radiated discourses aimed at sex, intensifying people's awareness of it as a constant danger, and this in turn created a further incentive to talk about it. One day in 1867, a farmhand from the village of Lapkur, who was somewhat simple-minded, employed here, then there, depending on the season, living hand to mouth from a little charity, or in exchange for the worst sort of labour, sleeping in barns and stables, was turned into the authorities. At the border of a field he had obtained a few caresses from a little girl, just as he had done before, and seen done by the village urchins round about him. For at the edge of the wood, or in the ditch by the road leading to San Nicola, they would play the familiar game called curdled milk. So he was pointed out by the girl's parents to the mayor of the village, reported by the mayor to the gendarmes, led by the gendarmes to the judge, who indicted him and turned him over first to a doctor, then to two other experts who not only wrote their report but also had it published. What is the significant thing about this story? The pettiness of it all, the fact that this everyday occurrence in the life of village sexuality, these inconsequential bucolic pleasures, could become, from a certain time, the object not only of a collective intolerance but of a judicial action, a medical intervention, a careful clinical examination, and an entire theoretical elaboration. The thing to note is that they went so far as to measure the brain pan, study the facial bone structure, and inspect for possible signs of degenerescence the anatomy of this personage, who up to that moment had been an integral part of village life, that they made him talk, that they questioned him concerning his thoughts, inclinations, habits, sensations, and opinions. And then, acquitting him of any crime, they decided finally to make him into a pure object of medicine and knowledge an object to be shut away till the end of his life in the hospital at Marivie, but also one to be made known to the world of learning through a detailed analysis. One can be fairly certain that during this same period the Lapkur schoolmaster was instructing the little villagers to mind their language and not talk about all these things aloud, but this was undoubtedly one of the conditions enabling the institutions of knowledge and power to overlay this everyday bit of theatre with their solemn discourse. So it was that our society, and it was doubtless the first in history to take such measures, assembled around these timeless gestures, these barely furtive pleasures between simple-minded adults and alert children, a whole machinery for speechifying, analysing and investigating. Between the licentious Englishman who earnestly recorded for his own purposes the singular episodes of his secret life, and his contemporary, this village half-wit who would give a few pennies to the little girls for favours the older ones refused him, there was without doubt a profound connection. In any case, from one extreme to the other, sex became something to say, and to say exhaustively in accordance with deployments that were varied, but all, in their own way, compelling. Whether in the form of a subtle confession in confidence or an authoritarian interrogation, sex, be it refined or rustic, had to be put into words. A great polymorphous injunction bound the Englishman and the poor Lorrainese peasant alike. As history would have it, the latter was named Jouy. Since the 18th century, sex has not ceased to provoke a kind of generalized discursive erethism. And these discourses on sex did not multiply apart from or against power, but in the very space and as the means of its exercise. Incitements to speak were orchestrated from all quarters, apparatuses everywhere for listening and recording, procedures for observing, questioning and formulating. Sex was driven out of hiding and constrained to lead a discursive existence. From the singular imperialism that compels everyone to transform their sexuality into a perpetual discourse, to the manifold mechanisms which, in the areas of economy, pedagogy, medicine and justice, incite, extract, distribute and institutionalize the sexual discourse, an immense verbosity is what our civilization has required and organized. Surely no other type of society has ever accumulated, and in such a relatively short span of time, a similar quantity of discourses concerned with sex. It may well be that we talk about sex more than anything else. We set our minds to the task. We convince ourselves that we have never said enough on the subject, 
that through inertia or submissiveness we conceal from ourselves the blinding evidence, and that what is essential always eludes us, so that we must always start out once again in search of it. It is possible that where sex is concerned, the most long-winded, the most impatient of societies is our own. But as this first overview shows, we are dealing less with a discourse on sex than with a multiplicity of discourses produced by a whole series of mechanisms operating in different institutions. The Middle Ages had organized around the theme of the flesh and the practice of penance a discourse that was markedly unitary. In the course of recent centuries, this relative uniformity was broken apart, scattered, and multiplied in an explosion of distinct discursivities, which took form in demography, biology, medicine, psychiatry, psychology, ethics, pedagogy, and political criticism. More precisely, the secure bond that held together the moral theology of concupiscence and the obligation of confession, equivalent to the theoretical discourse on sex and its first-person formulation, was, if not broken, at least loosened and diversified. Between the objectification of sex in rational discourses and the movement by which each individual was set to the task of recounting his own sex, there has occurred, since the 18th century, a whole series of tensions, conflicts, efforts at adjustment and attempts at retranscription. So it is not simply in terms of a continual extension that we must speak of this discursive growth, it should be seen rather as a dispersion of centers from which discourses emanated, a diversification of their forms and the complex deployment of the network connecting them. Rather than the uniform concern to hide sex, rather than a general prudishness of language, what distinguishes these last three centuries is the variety, the wide dispersion of devices that were invented for speaking about it, for having it be spoken about, for inducing it to speak of itself, for listening, recording, transcribing, and redistributing what is said about it. Around sex, a whole network of varying, specific, and coercive transpositions into discourse. Rather than a massive censorship, beginning with the verbal proprieties imposed by the age of reason, what was involved was a regulated and polymorphous incitement to discourse. The objection will doubtless be raised that if so many stimulations and constraining mechanisms were necessary in order to speak of sex, this was because there reigned over everyone a certain fundamental prohibition. Only definite necessities, economic pressures, political requirements, were able to lift this prohibition and open a few approaches to the discourse on sex, but these were limited and carefully coded. So much talk about sex, so many insistent devices contrived for causing it to be talked about, but under strict conditions. Does this not prove that it was an object of secrecy, and more important, that there is still an attempt to keep it that way? But this often stated theme, that sex is outside of discourse, and that only the removing of an obstacle, the breaking of a secret, can clear the way leading to it, is precisely what needs to be examined. Does it not partake of the injunction by which discourse is provoked? Is it not with the aim of inciting people to speak of sex that it is made to mirror, at the outer limit of every actual discourse, something akin to a secret whose discovery is imperative, a thing abusively reduced to silence, and at the same time difficult and necessary, dangerous and precious to divulge? We must not forget that by making sex into that which, above all else, had to be confessed, the Christian pastoral always presented it as the disquieting enigma, not a thing which stubbornly shows itself, but one which always hides, the insidious presence that speaks in a voice so muted and often disguised that one risks remaining deaf to it. Doubtless the secret does not reside in that basic reality in relation to which all the incitements to speak of sex are situated. Whether they try to force the secret, or whether in some obscure way they reinforce it by the manner in which they speak of it, it is a question, rather, of a theme that forms part of the very mechanics of these incitements, a way of giving shape to the requirement to speak about the matter, a fable that is indispensable to the endlessly proliferating economy of the discourse on sex. What is peculiar to modern societies, in fact, is not that they consigned sex to a shadow existence, but that they dedicated themselves to speaking of it ad infinitum, while exploiting it as the secret.